Welcome to the Cool Tools Show. I'm Mark Frauenfelder, Editor-in-Chief of Cool Tools, a website of tool recommendations written by our readers. You can find us at cool-tools.org. I'm joined by my co-host, Kevin Kelly, founder of Cool Tools. Hey, Kevin. Hey, it's great to be here. In each episode of the Cool Tools Show, Kevin and I talk to a guest about some of his or her favorite uncommon and uncommonly good tools they think others should know about. Our guest this week is Lawrence Lazar. After a 25-year career as an e-commerce product leader, Lawrence recently retired due to the loss of his central vision from a genetic eye disease. In his retirement, Lawrence is concentrating on his infrared landscape photography practice, as well as launching a podcast about maintaining a lifelong creative practice. Hey, Lawrence, how are you? Good. It's a uh fun to get to talk to you guys in person. I'm so used to hearing you on my headphones every uh, every Friday. <laughs> well, we hope that we can be a little bit more interactive than just your normal podcast. <laughs> Definitely. Thank you for your, uh, we're looking forward to your suggestions. And I know you have some uh, surprises for us. Sure. Things we don't ordinarily cover. So yeah. It's really great. Yeah. So, so why don't you go ahead and, and start telling us about uh, the tools? And you, and we can start with the magnetic spice tin. Yeah. So the, these are spice tins that I got before I lost my vision. It's only in the last year that I've lost my vision. Um, and so I've, I've had these for years. And, but since I've lost my vision, they become even more valuable. So basically what they are is round metallic spice tins that you stick to a, a sheet of thin steel that goes inside a cabinet. So the idea is you have a, you open your cabinet door and there are all these spice tins facing out. Um, and so I've used them for years cause I have a, I, I like to say I have a spice problem. I, I, I have way <laughs> too many spices. Um, but since I lost my vision, it became even more invaluable because uh, the idea of finding spices, uh, reading is what I can't do. So I'm legally blind, which means basically I, I can't read. Um, so I can still see the world. I just have lost my central vision and, and the acuity that goes with it. So I, I can barely read anything. So with these spice tins, what I did was actually kind of hack them where they come with a label that goes over the center of the tin. Um, I, I started using dynamo labels, um, the old dynamo labels where it's mm -hmm. white background with uh, high contrast black text on them. Um, mm -hmm. And then I keep them all alphabetical so that in general, I kind of know if I'm, you know, if I'm looking for a specific spice, I'll know where it is. Um, and the other thing that's been helpful by removing the labels that come with them and using the dynamo labels is I can see a lot more of the color of what's inside there. So for instance, I can still see many colors. So if I'm looking for paprika, I'll go look for the red tin. Um, but like mm -hmm. I said, I had these long before I lost my vision. Um, and they've been a lifesaver, um, since I've lost my vision. And I guess because they're magnetic, you could kind of also um, remember kind of their location and where something was and we just replace it. So you kept them in the same order. Exactly. So I keep them alphabetical and that's been really, really important for me. Um, and so for, for me, as I've been losing my vision, it's been important to kind of retrain myself and to use systems. Um, and so things like this have been really, really helpful. Um, one of the things I should point out it, with these tins, the, the link that I sent you is you buy the tins themselves, but you still have to buy the piece of steel that they attach to. And there's two different types of steel that you can get for, for these things. Um, one is uh, just a piece of metal. The other ones have indentations, round indentations that fit the tins. Those, I've, we tried some of those. They were not very helpful because they really kind of define where the tins go. So for instance, I have 64 of these things fit within two different cabinet, uh, cabinet doors. And so I've really packed them in. So if you get the ones that have the indentations, it really limits your ability to place them. So I, I go for the one without any indentations. But my understanding was that besides putting them kind of on a flat horizontal surface, you can also put them on a vertical wall. Is that correct? That's how I have them. I have them, uh, okay. I have them vertically. And that's really what they're meant to do is to, to go vertically so that you can use the inside of a cabinet. Like for instance, my daughter lives in a tiny apartment in Brooklyn with very little cabinet space. And these have been really helpful for her. The, the labels that you use 
Are they the kind of labels where you punch into the plastic tape so you can actually like feel the letters? No, the, these, the new dyn the old dynamos, you know, when we were kids used to have that raised lettering. Yeah. Now it's not, it's just thermal. Um, and it's, it, right. there's, there's no texture to it, but that's the other thing that's helpful for me with this is I have some tools, which I'll be talking about next that when I can't read something, I point a tool at it that reads it for me. And so that's the other thing is that since I have all the labels outward, I could just point my my uh, reader tool at it to tell me what's in the tin if I can't read that particular one. Wow, that is a great segue. I need to hear about this pointer tool. Yeah, so this was, um, of, of all the tools that I've used um, since losing my vision, this is the most gee whiz one. Um, so this company, Orcam, has this little reader that's about the size of a Sharpie. And um, basically what it has is it has an internal computer. It has a laser pointer, a light, and a camera. And what you do is you point it at something, and it shines a laser pointer at it so that it tells you what it is you're looking at. So it points a red laser. And then it takes a photograph of what you're looking at. And within maybe under two seconds, it reads to you whatever it just saw. Um, so for instance, if I'm trying to read a recipe, which I really struggle with, I just point this at it and it will read me the whole page. But, but what makes it even more amazing is it's not, uh, internet connected at all. It's all self-contained. So for instance, if I'm out and about in the world, um, if, if I was out in the woods hiking and I come across a sign to tell you to go this direction, this trail, and it gives you the name of a trail and there's no internet connectivity, this thing would work. Wait, wait, so, so this, um, you're going by so fast, I'm having to digest okay. this. So all, the, so the, all the AI, so to speak, is, mm -hmm. is built inside this little handheld device. Yeah. And um, I, I maybe missed it. So is it speaking what you read? D does it say what it is that, that it's reading? Oh, yeah. I, it reads it out loud. Um, it reads it out loud, and, and, and presumably in English, I guess. In, in English, yeah. Uh, how would you rate its accuracy? Um, it's phenomenal uh, at what it does. It's it's just it's it awes me how it can how accurate it is. Um, the the one downside I'd say is you don't you can't choose the voice that you use like with you know Siri where you can you know pick all these different voices and the inflections are more human. It sounds robot like to be honest. Uh, so it lacks inflections, but the accuracy is stunning. Um, and so I've used it, you know, for instance, like when I'm out and about in the world and, and I come to a store, I can't read any sign on the store. And I've actually tried being in a parking lot and pointing it at the sign of a store and it will tell me what the name of the store is. Or I've also used it to point it at street signs and it will tell me what, what street sign I'm uh, the name of the street. Right. So, so if you're kind of say pointing at a book, mm -hmm. um, how does it know which part of the page that you are that it's reading, or, or I mean, how how narrow of a beam is it? Like, if you're pointing at a store, um, is the I guess the text is could look like it's a book sized text from far away. I'm I'm just curious about how you point it to get what you are looking for and does it read it like instantaneously as you're kind of going on or does it kind of store it and buffer it I'm, no it, it, bit. it reads it fairly instantaneously so what it does is it takes a photograph and then does some ocr on the photograph oh so you hear the camera clicking so you'll hear the camera click and then you wait like under two seconds and it'll just read okay. what it sees it, it has two modes one has a pointer that is like an arrow so you can underline a specific piece of text the other one it has a bounding box that you can so for instance if you're trying to read a whole page of something you fit the page within the bounding box and it reads it to you but that would depend that you have some vision to be able to do that then. yes and and so what they say is tools like this are for people with low vision so you would need to have some level of vision um in order to use this tool mm -hmm. okay wow that is really amazing 
Yeah, it's it's a very pricey tool. <laughs> it's like twenty five hundred dollars, so it's not no. for the faint of heart. Uh, it's very specialized, but they also have uh, a couple of other models that are pricier that attach to your glasses and will identify people. Um, they they're getting very impressive what they can That's do. Cool. Yeah. So for instance, you can program it to point it at somebody and say, you know, that, you know, that's Mark, that's Kevin. And then when you go by that person, the device, which is attached, you can get a version that's attached to your glasses will say, that's Mark, that's Kevin. Wow. That would help for people who have face blindness. Exactly. And, th and that's actually one of the things with my vision loss is just as I can't read anymore, I can't see faces. Mm -hmm. um, because this, the center of my, my, um, the center of my eye has a very large blind spot. So faces mm -hmm. are problematic for me. Mm -hmm. And, and I guess the next step, if it doesn't have it already, but the next step would be to have that, um, this cam reader, um, communicate via Bluetooth to ear pods or AirPods. Yeah, this does have and that. It, it's so, okay. So, so it has both a uh, Bluetooth as well as, um, I guess it's an eighth inch jack. So you can plug in headphones or use, um, I tend to use it without the, the headphones. I tend to turn it on and off for specialized purposes. When I'm, for instance, reading a long document, um, I tend to do it on my computer using the speech to text. It's just a much more comfortable way for me to read. Right, right. So I tend to use this in specialized situations. Like I said, uh, uh, a, a recipe book or I get a letter in the mail. Um, so I tend to turn it on and off and don't use it for very very long periods of time. I was thinking of more of like if you're out and about kind of walking around and you didn't really want to bring notice or have other people hear it. Um, yeah. You, that For outside in public, it was kind of be uh, cool to have it whisper in your ear. Yeah, exactly. Um, okay. That's called the Orcam read. Yeah. And then I put a, uh, a, Another tool for people who just want to check out this technology, given that the OrCam Read is $2,500, there's an, an awesome tool from Microsoft called Seeing AI, and that's free, and it's, it's a, smartphone, a smartphone tool. And you could download that now for free, and basically it has a number of tools. So the first one is text recognition. So when you turn it on, it immediately goes into camera mode and whatever it's pointed at, it will read the text. Similar to the OrCam read, it's not as accurate. And the challenge with it is you have to hold it totally still. Um, mm. But like I said, it's it's a free tool and it has other very cool things like a barcode scanner. So for instance, going to the grocery store for me is a nightmare. Um, so what I can do is I point it, I would point this thing at the barcode and it would tell me what the product is. Um, mm. They also have a very cool tool in there that it will read the scene. So for instance, if I, I pointed it at my wife and uh, you know, it said 35 year old woman smiling with a pair of glasses and my wife is not 35. So she was delighted by the fact that it said <laughs> a 35 year old woman. And I tried it again and said 35 year old woman who's smiling wearing glasses. Um, but you can point it at the room yeah. and it'll say, you know, you're, you're in a room with a table and a couple of chairs. So this technology is really evolving in you know yeah, in fast. front of us but but the 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 technology really is g whiz of all the tools i picked these are the most g whiz ones yeah yeah i think with the advent of smart glasses we're, we'll see a lot more of um of this kind of thing um, coming forward and smart glasses the really good ones will have um audio at the on the stems so you you'll you'll hear and that's a large component of uh of um of that experience but yeah i i think um this is really great good stuff to know well thank You're you so cool so um tell us about your third uh choice yeah this is a, a tool called the logic keyboard um so one of the things when i was still working one of the things i really struggled with is i'm a mac user and and mac products are notoriously beautifully designed but can be a little low contrast. And so the keyboard, for instance, I, I there's no way I can really read my, my keyboard on my computer anymore. Mm -hmm. So what I got was this company Logic, Logic Keyboard has a number of keyboards. I got the one that is high contrast and all the keys mm -hmm. are basically yellow. Um, you can get <laughs> black and white combinations. You can get 
different color combinations. I have uh, yellow keys with very large, high contrast letters on them. And this has oh, been a yeah. lifesaver uh, for me. Yeah. And, and it looks like uh, it looks like something from the highway department. Yeah, exactly. Um, I would love this. I, even though my vision is fine, I think I need to get this because it is so um, bold and over the top. So it's, yes, yeah, bright yellow keys with huge black mm -hmm. letters, something that you might – be able to see from five miles away. Yeah. Whoa. Yeah. It's amazing. And they also make skins for, for your laptop as well. Um, the, the other thing that's nice about it. Uh, is, uh, excuse me. Are the, is, is this just a skin or is this actual? No, this is keyboard? a physical uh, machined keyboard. This okay, one. I think right, it's okay. aluminum. Um, and it comes with a US, two USB ports on it. And the, with the high contrast one, it also comes with a USB light. So it plugs in the side and it's built to basically provide a, a light for the keyboard. And that's, that's the other challenge with my vision is I need a tremendous amount of light to see anything. Mm -hmm. And so I also then put a link to this same company creates a whole series of keyboards. So they make a lot of multimedia keyboards. So I link to one that's specific to Adobe Premiere. Um, and so they have ones for people who are working with like Photoshop, Premiere, Final Cut Pro, any number of media mm. tools. And with those keyboards, they lay out all the macros on the keyboard. Um, right. I, there's a link in there. It's, it's, it's a little crazy to look at given that they provide all the information for every key. So it can be kind of overwhelming. Um, but for people who use macros or want to remember, okay, how, how do you, you know, how do you label a photo as, as with the red label in, um, in Lightroom, it's the seven key and you, I have to go do a search to find out how to do that. It's all built into the keyboard. So they probably put out 20 or more different keyboards um, mm -hmm. for specialized purposes. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, in the kind of graphic field from movie editing onward. Um, these are huge help if that's if this is your kind of your job. I find that remembering the key is um, <laughs> for an occasional user like me is almost as difficult as remembering a shortcut. But if you're this is your day job, man, this is really great. Yeah, it's a little overwhelming to look at, but you know it provides all the information right there. Right, right. So. Um, Tell us about your fourth choice. Uh, so this is a, a service from the Library of Congress that's a library. I think they uh, uh, audiobook service for the blind. And so to get this service, you have to qualify and you have to get a doctor to fill out the form to qualify for it. So it's basically audible for free for, for blind people. And they have a physical player that looks like an old. It's kind of funny. The, the player looks like a cassette deck but you plug a USB book into it. It's kind, it's kind of funny. Um, but I use the smartphone app and it basically allows me, I have a library of hundreds of thousands of books that I, that I can get for free. Uh, so obviously with losing your vision, you know, reading books is impossible. So this service has been fantastic. But the thing that makes it even cooler is the fact that they have audio magazines. Um, and so when I, uh, qualified for the service. I was telling my wife, you know, they have magazines. Uh, the, the two magazines that I subscribe to are The New Yorker and Wired. Um, and I guess Condé Nast has, has worked out a deal with them. So they have all the, their magazines there. So I can listen to an audio version of uh, Wired, New, uh, The New Yorker. Um, many different magazines will be read to me, which is just uh, amazing because that was one of the hardest things about losing my vision. It's not only access to books, you can get books from like Audible and lots of audiobook services, but magazines was a real loss for me. So this was a real godsend so that I can listen to an audio version of a magazine. And, and how contemporary, how, how soon after the magazine is released, are they pretty current or you have to wait a couple of months? Oh no, it's, it's within a week or two at the wow. most. Yeah. Wow. And, and the New Yorker tends to be, it's a six and a half hour read each time. So they have somebody, you know, right on top of it. Wow. And uh, it's not a machine, right? So this is like a human who is going through and they're 
being smart about what they're reading and how they read it. Yep, it's it's human read, um, and there's a table of contents. You so you can see all the articles um, when you go to your traditional table of contents. It'll take it'll have bookmarks to go to that specific article. Wow, that's that looks amazing. And um, so, is it easy to navigate from one article to another if you're like not? liking one of them yeah it's it's it has the normal controls to to move through things and they have um on the smartphone app you can move it's it's the same thing as chapters so uh the there'll be one chapter which will be the name of the article and then if you press you know go to the next um chapter it'll then read the article so it's it's very well uh, marked for you to be able to navigate it and and you said at the beginning that, that this is sort of um, a, a prescription in some sense that you you have to have a, you have to have a legitimate reason to um, to benefit from this. Yeah. Uh, so yes, yeah, so you definitely have to qualify. Your doctor has to fill out paperwork, and then uh -huh. it goes through. I think your local state, your state library, then qualifies you, and then gives you access to the Library of Congress. Um, but then in there, I also put a link to Audible, which is certainly a tool that everybody knows. But the thing that I wanted to call out with this is I know from from the show that you guys are, you know, not, it's, it sounds like you're not big on audiobooks. You or at least talk about Kindles and reading books and making notes in them. Um, and I was not an audio book guy at all. I'm a big believer in print books. Both my parents were writers and, you know, I have a house full of books. And I just was never an audiobook guy. My wife and I would listen to audiobooks when we were in long car trips, but that was about it because I kind of looked down my nose at them that they weren't really reading. Um, but since I lost my central vision, then that's my only way to to be able to read. And what I found was, and, and the reason I put a link to Audible was I found that I gave audiobooks short shrift. Um because to read a book, you have to physically sit down and find the time and find the location to do it. And I think a lot of us just have struggled to find enough time in our life to read. And what's been um, amazing to move to audiobooks is I listen to books now when I'm gardening um, or going for a walk. Um, so I'm I'm actually going through, you know, a factor of maybe five times as many books in, in, you know, in, in a year than I would have gone through before, because, you know, when I'm on the computer, I'll listen to a book. Um, whereas before, like I said, you know, find carving out time to either read a magazine or a book can be really difficult. Yeah. I'm, I'm actually a very big fan of audible books and, um, from the days when they were called books on tape. Um, and I have, I have, most of my fiction actually is consumed by auditing it rather than, than reading it, um, even today still. Uh, and Audible is a huge, uh, fantastic source, but I also would um, recommend to people that your local library has great resources in you know, recorded books, and there's all kinds of programs where you can download and, and borrow, essentially, um, Audible books from your local library. Yeah, I was I was debating what service to use to be the free version of this since the 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 Library of Congress is only for people who are medical issues. I um, mean, I thought about the libraries and um but I just went with Audible just cuz more people know about it. But you're absolutely right. There's there's lots of resources with your local um library, but the one thing that I found I could not find a reliable source for audio magazines. Um, and I put a link into there for the, the New Yorker has really taken the lead where in just recently they are now have um, actors reading their articles. So you can get a lot of the articles in that week's New Yorker through their, um, through their smartphone app and have it read to you. And this is, this is true. If you're just a regular consumer, you don't have to have a medical reason for that. Right. Yeah. This is just right. any user. And, and, you know, I have to say, so as somebody who's, you know, been reading the New Yorker for years, the kind of classic thing about the New Yorker is that you feel guilty that you don't get to it. And everybody has a big stack of New Yorkers that you make you kind of sad because you never actually get to read through them. So I found that I'm actually processing a lot of the New Yorker, like for instance, Lawrence Wright had a, an, a, a, mm -hmm. a, an article, the year of pandemic. Article, yeah. yeah. And, mm -hmm. and what my friends, I asked them if they read the article and they're like, eh, it's 40 pages. Um, 
Whereas for me, I put it on double speed and I went through it in, you know, about 45 minutes and I got to listen to the article. Well, there, there, there again is a tip for folks. Um, you can increase the speed um, of listening to not just books, but uh, podcasts, by the way. And that's the only way that I listen to podcasts is I'm at 1.5, 1.7, 7.5. 7. Um, 2X is a big yeah. step. If, if you have a professional reader, you can handle it, but sometimes podcast guests are already fast speaking and that's really hard. Anyway, um, check out the, the speed X when you're listening to books or podcasts or magazine articles. Yeah. That, that uh, it's funny. Once I started speeding them up, it, it drives my wife crazy because it just comes mm-hmm. way too quickly. But now when I go to one X, it right. feels like it's really dragging once you get right. used to the speed it up version. Right. And since we're talking about that, by the way, you can do the same thing with YouTube. Yeah. Um, in the bottom of YouTube in the little gear, you can accelerate the speed of um, YouTube. And um, if you have tutorials, it's really the way to, to consume those. Yeah. Seth Godin actually had one of his tools was uh, um, an overlay on top of any video window that will allow you to access the yeah. speed up slowdown. Right, right, right. Exactly. So these are really, really great. I know you have a bonus. We have a couple of minutes. Yeah. Maybe you want to tell us about your bonus um, tool? Yeah. So one of the things is that a lot of websites don't pay much attention to accessibility. Um, And so, for instance, for me, the challenge in looking at a website um, is contrast um, and font colors. And so most websites are not necessarily conscious of the needs of people with disabilities. And so that's if you're using screen readers, that how, you know, how uh, the screen reader will interact with the website or how, if you're trying to read it, how, how viewable it is. So there, there's lots of plugins for or, uh, Chrome extensions for developers for websites. This one that I picked, the Lighthouse extension, the thing that's great about that is they have a, they, in addition to SEO and mobile and basically, you know, the traditional thing of giving you a scorecard of how well your, your website does, this one has an accessibility score that will tell you you know, you get a 93 out of 100 and here's the things that you can correct and it'll drill down into the DOM to tell you, you know, here's the things you need to, to, to fix on your website to get a high accessibility score. Okay. So if I, if, if you, if somebody has a website and they want to, to know what the score is and maybe where they can improve, then you go to the site or do you load this? I mean, what is the actual tool? So it's basically, it's a Chrome extension. And so there in your um, icon bar in Chrome, there's a little mm-hmm. picture of a lighthouse. And when you click on that, it'll then just run a report on the site. And you can okay. say, show me SEO, show me you know mobile, mm-hmm. um, show me accessibility. So it's just one of many reports that you can run okay. on the website. That's really great. Well, thank you for, for all of these, sure. um, because um, what we've known for a long time is that um, making things better for uh, usability helps everybody in the long term, in the long run. And so, um, as you know, as we've just discovered, having things read out loud is really great, even um, if you have sight working. And um, thank you for sharing these really cool things we wouldn't have known otherwise. Oh, sure. Yeah. And, and there, I think I've had trouble finding exact statistics on vision loss um, because there seems to be a wide variant in the, in the data, but the, the number that I thought was most interesting is there's 11 million people in America with macular degeneration alone, Mm -hmm. and they expect that to double by the year 2050. Um, Mm -hmm. So I think there's a lot more people who have a fairly significant amount of vision loss. And because it tends to be in seniors, it's accepted as it just comes with getting older. Um, Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'm I'm only 60, so I'm fairly young to lose my vision. But, but, you know, just because somebody is in their 80s doesn't mean they shouldn't be able to use a computer or or interact with technology at all. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, thank you um, yeah. for that reminder. And um, uh, yeah, we'd love to hear even more um, other tools, maybe audio 
that um, again would be helpful to know about. And as you say, even if it doesn't apply to you, it might certainly apply to one of your loved ones. And so these are good tools to know. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much, Lawrence. Sure. Hey, everybody. It's Mark from the Cool Tools Podcast. I want to thank you for being a listener to Cool Tools. And I also would like to let you know about our Patreon page. If you would like to support the Cool Tools show, as well as our video channel, the website, and all the newsletters that we do, you can go to patreon.com slash cool tools. That's just one word, cool tools and pledge any amount you want. You could even pledge a dollar a month. Every little bit helps. We have editors, we pay for transcribing costs, we pay our reviewers. Every bit of money that you contribute goes towards supporting the show. I'd like to give a shout out to our supporters of the Cool Tools podcast. This week, I'd like to thank the following Patreon supporters. Bill Schuler, Bob Kay, Brian Pelly, Carl D. Patterson, Chad Cosby, Chris Wheeland, Chris Weirstook, Craig Tooker, Dan O'Brien, Dean Putney, Danelle Cunningham, Evan Barker, Graham Medlin, Hans Riesbeck, Helen Hegedus, Jerry Kearns, Jim Lesko, Jim Spofford, John Pollock, John Burdenbaugh, Keith O., Ken Altman, Les Howard, Lauren Bast, Mock Nerd, Malton Make, Mark Goebel, Matt Gromes, Michael Douglas, Michael Jones, and Michael Pecorini. Thanks to all of you for supporting the Cool Tools Show. We really appreciate it. 